hey, that's not fair. I do not say every philosopher is my favorite. I say many of them are one of my favorites. Because, yes, I am sorry, I like a lot of these ideas, right? I designed my class in a way that brings me joy. I really like Rousseau. I don't like some of the things he says in some of his other books, and you'll see that he makes some mistakes even here, but I love the ideas of this origin of inequality. Let's say something briefly about who Rousseau is, but I'm going to do this only in a vague, sort of indirect way, right? I don't think we really need to talk much about exactly who this guy is. But let me say this. Rousseau is very French, but I think we can reverse that causal order, right? I think France is like France partly because of Rousseau. He came along at a very important part in their origin, and he is partly responsible for who they are. Just like we would say, if it weren't for Locke and Smith, right, especially Locke, right, America wouldn't be what we call America. It's those influences that made it what it is. But let's say something about that distinction between what it is to be French and what it is to be American. We can point to things that Americans have a lot of fun making fun of French people, making fun of Canadians. We do this. And yes, in World War II, they did a bunch of stupid collaboration with the Nazis. So did we, by the way, but most people don't know that. But anyway, so that is very much open to ridicule. But something else that they do well, and Americans are jealous of, right, besides their food and their beautiful cities, is Americans are uniquely terrified of their government. Americans are very individualistic, and you could say very violent. And yes, we get so afraid of our government that people overreact and get violent and stupid, and they just lash out in anger online or in reality. But notice how different it is in France. In France, the people aren't terrified of their government. The government is terrified of the people. And not in an American sense, where the government is afraid they're going to get shot. That would be our leaders. Wow, we have a lot of guns. In France, they're politically afraid of their people. In France, they know that if they do something the people don't approve of, the people will protest in a unified way until that idea is overthrown. In the United States, we feel helpless, and then we get violent and aggressive, right? But nothing really changes, because our government knows we can just keep doing things, that most of the things the American people won't pay attention to. But in France, even the tiniest shifts in policy, the public is paying attention to, and the, and the leaders know that they better be careful. That's brilliant. That's how it should work. Okay, here we go. So let's talk about Rousseau's view of human nature. Now, well, let's begin in a weird way. Rousseau is going to disrespect his other philosophers. Not too many people do this, right? He's going to throw shade almost directly at Hobbes and some other thinkers that are saying similar things to Hobbes. But listen to this. Let's just pretend he's talking directly to Thomas Hobbes, because he is in a way. Very beginning of the Rousseau piece. The philosophers who have inquired into the foundation of society have all felt the necessity of going back to a state of nature. That's directly Hobbes' phrase, state of nature. But not one of them has got there. So again, we say that most people, most political theorists, do need to think of what people are innately like before you design a society that's going to fit that. So now skip three lines. Every one of them, in short, cons constantly dwelling on wants, avidity, oppression, desires, and pride, has transferred to the state of nature ideas which are acquired in society, so that in speaking of the savage, they describe the social man. Notice, this is exactly what I thought Plato was also doing. In saying, giving you a magic ring of no consequences, does that reveal the innate self? No, I think you're just taking the social self and putting them in an environment without consequences. You are just seeing the social self at its worst, not the innate self. This is what he thinks Hobbes has done as well. Hobbes has simply looked around and said, wow, these people are competitive and miserable. That must be what it was like before laws. And now before laws, if they were this aggressive and miserable, it must have been chaos and war of all against all. Yeah, that's what we find in Hobbes. So now let's let Rousseau describe what he thinks about the innate versus the social self. But let's start with the innate self. Now notice this idea. 
Whereas Plato says the ring is the innate self and the normal person without a ring is the social self, or Hobbes, state of nature, innate self, right, person in the social contract under a terrifying government is the social self. Rousseau is going to give them different names. He is going to say the innate self is the historical savage. Let's look at what people were like in a state of nature, different conception than Hobbes though. And then let's look at what they're like today. Again, so now we have these nice little placeholders. We can say the savage person is what we were originally like and what we are like inside. And the civilized person is what we are like in society. But we're going to have to watch out for the connotations of these words. Because of the way we are socialized in our country, savage and civilized, and we have a lot of influence in other countries, so a lot of people think this way, we automatically hear savage and we think what? We think aggressive. We think rude. We think someone that can't be trusted. Right. And we use savage this way in a compliment for thug life and things like this. But so savage has negative connotations. Well, you've got to watch out for that because that's not what Rousseau has in mind. And the same thing for civilized. It has positive connotations. If we say someone is civilized, we mean they're polite and can be trusted and they're kind and things like this. Those are not the connotations Rousseau is implying. Let's read. Let's go to the third paragraph of the Rousseau piece. If we consider him, the savage, in a word, just as he must have come from the hands of nature, I see him satisfying his hunger at the first oak, and his thirst at the first brook, finding his bed at the foot of the tree which, is a, which afforded him a repast, and with that all his wants supplied. While the earth was left to its natural, natural fertility, and covered with immense forest, whose trees were never mutilated by the axe, it would present on every side both sustenance and shelter for every species of animal. Pause there. Rousseau and Hobbes both make serious mistakes in their anthropology. Rousseau, right, too optimistic, Hobbes too pessimistic. Let's talk briefly about the key bullet points in their mistakes. Hobbes makes a mistake of assuming everyone, and by the way, when asked for support, Hobbes said, look at the Native Americans, they're all killing each other. No, right? Okay. Let's talk about their mistakes and let's see what the actual anthropology says, which is somewhere in between. Hobbes exaggerates in thinking that every pre-civilized person was trying to kill each other. No, that's very rare. But Rousseau exaggerates in saying life was always easy, and also in saying that the pre-civilized people were isolated individuals. No, human beings have always had families and small groups. Later, larger and larger groups, especially with agricultural revolution, you need a bunch of workers so you get as many people together as you can, right? Anyway. So, Rousseau is going to exaggerate saying these are little individuals. Hobbes is going to exaggerate in saying they're all trying to kill each other as individuals. Well, what is the actual anthropology? The actual anthropological history of human beings is a, is a mix, not of isolation, always in small groups at least, but in the way that they are aggressive. The aggressiveness, when you study the archaeology, is a mixed bag depending on what's going on in the situation. When you find areas where there are decent resources of food, the people living there are very peaceful. They are not warfaring very often at all. They only become warfaring when resources get scarce and there's a competition for them. And what you find is a similar sort of thing when you look at different groups of indigenous societies throughout history. What do you find? Some groups are warfaring a lot. They're always looking for resources. Some groups are never warfaring at all. But the majority are in between, just like you find among nations in, in the world. You will find phases where, say, 50 or 100 years, right, due to resources or situation, you will find certain groups that are warfaring. And then you will find them in another 100-year period, not warfaring at all. They've found their niche. And sometimes these go back and forth fairly rapidly. Sometimes you will find one generation of warfaring, and then they find a new situation, a new place to live as a hunter-gatherer, and then they're not warfaring at all. Well, if you think about it, as I pointed out, this is what nations are like. You find that nations with a bunch of imperialistic motivations being terrible warfarers, right? 
like the United States is now, we're always at war with somebody. And then you find countries realizing or finding that that's not working anymore. And so then they start to get along with other neighbors. We actually find that latter point more common in societies throughout history as time goes on. More and more countries are finding the need to get along and not be warfaring and imperial. And the United States is kind of a throwback, right? We are acting like countries acted normally 200 years ago. But we're here primarily for the moral psychology, right? The human nature aspects here. So let me read because these ideas are kind of mixed together. Again, I like it when authors are arguing back and forth between different positions, and Rousseau does this kind of all the time, so I'm going to have to read quite a bit, so please think of this as story time. Let me jump around and read a few parts of this, and then we can talk about our chart of human nature. So, here we go. So now I am in the middle indent on page two, where it begins, were it even. Were it even true that pity is no more than a feeling? which puts us in the place of the sufferer. A feeling, now notice, obscure yet lively in a savage, developed yet feeble in civilized man. Key phrase there. Notice, right? The savage is a big dum-dum. They don't understand what they're feeling, but they feel it strongly. It's a weird idea. They don't comprehend its meaning or its intent, but they feel this pity. What happens in civilized people? They understand it, yet it's feeble, right? It's a developed sense. They can talk about it, but it's very weak. We'll talk more. Skip about six lines. It is philosophy that isolates him. So now the civilized person. It is philosophy that isolates him and bids him say, at sight of the misfortune of others, perish if you will, I am secure. This is the civilized. Nothing but such general evils as threaten the whole community, 9-11, Ebola, COVID, can disturb the tranquil sleep of the philosopher or tear him from his bed. A murder may with impunity be committed under his window. He is only to put his hands to his ears and argue a little with himself to prevent nature, which is shocked within him, from identifying itself with the unfortunate sufferer. Uncivilized man, now notice the transition, the savage, has not this admirable talent, and for want of reason and wisdom, is always foolishly ready to obey the first promptings of humanity. Okay, so let's pause there and talk about this psychology. So let's look at the psychology of how the savage versus the civilized, our innate self versus our social self, treats people who are suffering. So, imagine you have this first situation. I know this is nuts. Okay, sorry, sorry, this is going to be disturbing. Imagine you are sitting around waiting, say, waiting for a movie to let you in or waiting for a restaurant, right? Waiting for your table to be ready. And you're sitting outside and as you look around, you see some skaters. Now, let's pretend that these skaters were imported from California where you find really good skaters. Sorry, New Mexico, but man, your skaters aren't very good. So let's pretend there's some California transplants, right? And they're skating and they are brilliant at this. Got it? No. You're watching them, and then you see one guy, everybody stands back and watches because he's going to try something really tricky. Good? And here's what you witnessed. You witness him coming to a stair rail, and he overshoots his ollie. Oh, no. Okay, let me demonstrate what you see. Here's our little skater, and here is the rail. Here is what he does. He comes up, overshoots his ollie, loses his board in midair, and... Sacks it, right? They call that sacking it. If your skateboard goes up into your butt, that's called a credit card, right? <laughs> that's the worst. I had that happen once. Oh my gosh. Now, how do you feel if you are literally watching someone sack it while they're skateboarding? I'm assuming all of you, even though this is just virtual video, just thinking of that imagery cringed a little bit, and especially as a, if you're a guy, right? You lowered your posture defending your junk right there. What happened? This is the, the psychology of how the savage responds to people who suffer. What happens? And by the way, this is the neuropsychology we still have. This is a brilliant picture, even though it's very simplistic, of the neuropsychology. If you study a book like Goleman on social intelligence, great book, super fun to read. 
If you read Goldman, you will find that we are wired to feel what other people are feeling. And in fact, we're wired to respond in a helping sort of gesture. When a little kid bumps their head, what do we do? We rub their head because that's what we would do if it was our head. That's how we're naturally, instinctively wired. Anyway, so now what would you say about this? You would say that against his will, the savage is feeling what the other person is suffering. So if a savage, go historically, is walking through a wooded area and sees someone that was attacked by an animal, their first response would be cringing in pain because they feel the other's pain. And so what do they do about it? They don't think a lot about it. They are dum-dums. The natural response is to do something. I have to help. Notice. The psychology is not a moral thoughtfulness. It is not, that could be me, I would want to be helped if that was me. It is, I have to help that person because it hurts to look at. I have to help them so I don't feel their pain anymore. I hurt, so I have to make it so that I don't hurt anymore. The best way to do that is to try to remedy their pain. Exactly. It is a thoughtless pity, a thoughtless compassion, hint, hint. The civilized man, by contrast, notice what he does. A murder is happening out his window. Oh, sorry, let's go back to the skater. What does a civilized person do? Oh, they film it, they laugh, and they put it on YouTube, right? Or World Star, right? Ah, oh, look, right? Anyway, sorry, sorry. What happens if a murder is happening outside his window? What does he do? Pretend, it, pretend it's not happening. Now, notice what the Rousseau says, and it's brilliant. He covers his ears and whispers to himself some philosophy. What is he doing? Think of Fromm. He is rationalizing. His inner self, is what Rousseau is saying, wants to do something. But the civilized person is intelligent. They've read some philosophy. They watch their news programs about how tricky and dangerous society is. And so they talk themselves out of doing anything. They want to help in their inner self, but their social self says, oh no, it could be a trap. And so they say all these ridiculous rationalizations. Oh, it could be a trick to get me outside and they're really trying to mug me. Or why do I pay taxes if I have to handle everything myself? Or, oh, it's probably some drag addict and they deserve it. It's probably all for the best. Or they get religious and say, God does everything for a reason, and so that person must deserve it, or they must be learning their lesson by being murdered? <laughs> I don't understand. Anyway, the rationalizations are ridiculous, as most of them are. They're usually complete lies, but they help us justify our actions we take. All right, so far so good. Now, let's look at how they think of property. So let's take an, a basic example of theft. Someone has, if you're a savage person, taken a mango from the tree in front of your cave. You're a civilized person. Someone is on your property, right? Doesn't even have to be theft. They're just on your property. Think of how we react. Let's go to, this is the second paragraph on page three. I'm going four lines into the paragraph that begins the, with the word some. Fourth line. One man, it is true, might seize the fruits which another had gathered, the game he had killed, or the cave he had chosen for shelter. But how would he ever be able to exact obedience? And what ties of dependence could there be among men without possessions? If, for instance, I am driven from one tree, I can go to the next. If I am disturbed in one place, what hinders me from going to another? And remember the anthropology. This was pretty standard. If you knew there were a ton of resources, you wouldn't fight over the multiple of abundant resources. You would let it go and get your own. In fact, most of the time, you would just wait, maybe yell out like, I'm here, and they would leave, or that's a time where you move on. Oh, other people are here. Let's go find another location. If it was really you thought it was a scarce resource in a savage, uncivilized, pre-civilized human situation, maybe you would fight briefly or, more likely, do a bunch of posturing, a bunch of shouting, right, <laughs> to make them flee. And most of the time they would. Anyway, continue next in depth. The first man who, having enclosed a piece of ground, bethought himself of saying, this is mine, and found people simple, he means stupid enough, to believe him, was the real founder of civil society. 
From how many crimes, wars, and murders, from how many horrors and misfortunes might not any one of us save mankind by pulling up the stakes or filling up the ditch and crying to his fellows, Beware of listening to this impostor. You are undone if you once forget that the fruits of the earth belong to us all and the earth itself to nobody. So we th I think we have enough now to fill out our chart. Let's bring back our ugly chart. What do we see? If we're looking at Rousseau Savage, notice, be very careful to keep those ideas separate and don't let the word confound you. What is the savage like? If they see someone suffering, Rousseau's saying they have to help because they feel it so strongly. Maybe they shouldn't. Maybe they're stupid, right? Maybe they rush to help someone when they really should be looking out for the animal that attacked them, right? Fine. But they're ready to act. But completely thoughtlessly, and, you know, we got to take see if we see that as a big critique. What would we say? Well, automatically we're up there in the compassion, sympathetic thing, but now we have a problem because of the way we use the words. Because we think that to be sympathetic or compassionate requires intent. And we have a hard time imagining the savage having any sort of intent. Do they wander the forest looking for someone to help, like they're with the Red Cross or Doctors Without Borders? No, this isn't their vocation. It is just when they're faced with suffering, they have to do something about it because our instincts tell us this. So what would we say about the innate self? We would say the innate self isn't thoughtful, but is compassionate or sympathetic, so I am going to cheat and put Rousseau on that line. It is not a vocation, they are not thoughtful, but the actions are the very definition of compassion. The very definition is you feel something for others strongly and have to act on it. You have to participate in their joy or help to ease their suffering. Sounds like compassion, but because it's not willed or intentional, maybe we would call it something like sympathetic as well, maybe something in between. And so what about the social self? What do we find in the civilized person? They talk themselves out of helping. How does a civilized person approach property? If someone just sets foot on their property, they want their gun out, right? If you're in Colorado, Florida, maybe even Texas, you can shoot someone even if they're not threatening you at all. They're just on your property. You are allowed to shoot if you feel threatened, even if it's just your property feels threatened. They're so weird. What would we say here? We would say that they are, notice, all of these theorists are agreeing on what the social self is like. We are apathetic. There are plenty of good pieces of evidence for showing that that is an easy position to defend. Civilized people seem apathetic about others. They don't act to help. And in Rousseau's case, notice because of the innate self telling them, oh, you should help. They have to talk themselves out of it. But I still say it's apathetic. The innate self wants to do something. The social self says, I better not. Plato and Hobbes, the innate self says, I should be selfish, right? The social self says, I shouldn't. We get this idea. We are these conflicted beings who are acting apathetic, even though that's not our innate self, no matter which type of theorist you agree with. Before we finish Rousseau, let me do a couple tangents. First, it's important to let him preach here at the end. So we're going to let Rousseau speak his mind because Rousseau is a huge influence on what's going to come next for us or in a couple weeks when we start talking about the social political, especially someone like Marx or someone like Kropotkin in the ideas about property. So let's read the last paragraph, page three. Do you not know that, that numbers of your fellow creatures are starving for want of what you have too much of? You ought to have had the express and universal consent of mankind before appropriating more of the common subsistence than you needed for your own maintenance. For the flaws which make social institutions necessary are the same as make the abuse of them unavoidable. What's the idea? Because we have laws that protect property so much, by the way, a lot of our laws are about protecting rich people's property. Smith will say the same thing at the very beginning of that reading. Quinn will say, what is the big tragedy in the world? That people lock up the food so that people can't have access to it. 
Nature allows access to food. We control them by locking it up as private property. Our founding fathers, what was the key move they make? The Declaration of Independence talks all about the freedom to pursue happiness. What did we change it to? We thought protecting property is the same thing by protecting the pursuit of happiness. So we wrote all our laws about protecting property, not about promoting happiness. Fine. So we will see that this idea of property will be a key thing for Quinn, for Marx, for Kropotkin. Last little tangent. Let me talk about the influence that these sorts of economic structures have. We will see this radically reflected in Smith and we already saw it in alienation in Marx. But let's have this little conversation. I want to ask you, right, just based on your experiences, what is a good man? Notice right there, sounds very sexist because I used a masculine word. And I did it on purpose. I think you can excuse this sexism. Now, part of the sexism is reverse sexism. I want to talk about what a good man is because... If I asked you what a good woman is, men would answer in the most thoughtless ways. If I asked men, heterosexual men, for example, what do you think makes a woman a good woman? You would hear the most embarrassing, trite observations. She laughs at my jokes, she likes sports, and her body is fit. Right? No! I want to see more depth in the psychology here, so I have to ask what a good man is. Because then I can get women talking about the kinds of things that make a good man a good man. And men have a lot of talk about this as well. So I think I'm going to get more profitable answers, right? More detail if I ask about a good man, because we are such a terribly sexist society. All right. So what do we hear? What are the key traits for a good man? Now, let me give you the usual answers. We are not together, so I can't ask you your in in input, but I think you would give me mostly this input. This is the history of this conversation. What do we hear? We hear things like a good man is one that is hardworking. The key word is ambitious. Even if they aren't successful, because we would put that on, on the list, a success. But even if they aren't successful, we're looking for successful traits of character. And amb ambitious goes to the very top. What do we also mean? Not lazy. We also want someone who is polite. We want someone that has a sense of humor. Now notice, good looking is very low down the list. Sorry guys, you're spending all your time at the gym and at the, at the barber shop. Sorry, other traits make you more attractive. Sense of humor is big, but ambition, not lazy, being punctual, that gets up there on the list. These are the key traits that make for a good man in the estimation of men or women. That's who we think makes for a good man. Look at it. Yes. Now, I hate this. I think you've got it all wrong. If you asked, what are the traits of a good soldier or a good worker in your mines or in your factories, then I think you've got it. You need someone punctual, polite, hardworking, and ambitious. You have just hired yourself a good factory worker. Does this make you a good human being? No. So let's ask a completely different set of questions. Let's ask, what makes for a good partner or father? And then you will see how silly your list is. You have just hired a new recruit. You haven't hired for yourself someone that would make a good partner or someone who would make a good father of your children. What do you, should you look for? You should look for traits like kindness, sensitivity, forgiveness, sympathy, compassion, patience, right? What are we doing? We are judging human beings by their economic efficiency. We have taken the economy as a moral recommender of human beings. It's insane. We think someone is good because of their economic role. Think of Nietzsche here. If in their economic role they're successful, we think good person. We use good human in the same way we would use good lawyer. What makes someone a good lawyer? Often terrible things. Think of how we judge Trump. Some people applaud him for being such a jerk because what? He's in politics, business, and he's successful. And so we think, good for you. People like me, 
He's a jerk. He's a terrible human being. I'm sorry. You might love his policies, and so you might separate the public from the private. You might say, that's the kind of politician that gets things done. But you have to admit, as a private person, you would hate to be married to that guy. You would hate to have him be your child's teacher. You would hate to have him be your co-worker, because he would take advantage of you and lie all the time. Sorry, people that love Trump, you know what I mean. Here is the ultimate test for finding a good person to be a partner or the father of your children. Now look at this. And this could give us good insights into how we do these weird judgments about people like Trump. Ask this question. If you are trying to determine if you found a good partner, ask this. How does he treat people that are mean to him? That's the key question. Because if you are going to be married to this person or spend time with them or have children with them, who is going to be mean to them? You are. No one has said meaner things to me than my sweet wife. Oh my gosh, she has yelled and screamed such hateful things at me. You are going to be mean to your partner, meaner than anyone else is to them. And how will they respond? Well, if you're looking for the ambitious, hardworking person that doesn't take guff from anyone, get ready to be abused and really mistreated. What do you want? Someone that is forgiving and caring and is nice to people, even that are mean to them. Cough, cough, Trump, right? How would you like to be married to that guy? Good. Sorry.